Good morning. Would you please join in in singing our opening hymn, our opening chant. Good morning, good morning. So I just want to welcome all of you, whether you were here in person or you were on Zoom or live stream on Facebook, we are so glad that you're here. And I was supposed to make a brief announcement before we started, but ha, um, just I want to thank you all for continuing to wear your masks and for continuing to practice healthy, safe social distancing or distance socializing because we want to keep each other healthy. You'll notice we have the doors open and we have a special electric, electrostatic, I knew I'd get it close to right, system that circulates our air. And so we are being very cognizant because this is how we take care of each other. It really is. And so we're grateful that you understand that and we appreciate you so much. Ah, let's, oh, you are. Listen, it only gets better from here. Okay, so let's go ahead and pray in. I invite you to just be comfortable where you are. Be where your body is, letting go of anything that has come before or perhaps what might be coming later, knowing that right here and right now, together, we recognize that there is one infinite loving power and presence. It is God. It is spirit. It is that universal mind, that intelligence that has brought us here, brought us here to this place in deep awareness and deep knowing and with the intention, the intention to reveal greater peace, greater love, greater joy, greater wisdom and to unify in the intention for all on this planet that we are here for God, we are here for peace. So I bless this service and I know with each breath that each of us takes, with each breath that God breathes as us, that blessing simply, oh, expands. It touches all. 
And we expand with this knowing that right where we are, God is and all is well, all is peace, all is love because we are willing, we are receptive, we are open. So I know that the wisdom that that is the divine itself is absolutely flowing freely, powerfully, and wonderfully through Dr. Mark that there is so much, so much light, so much fire from heaven and we all seek to, to, to receive and to take in as our own ah, strength and revelation of that which we need to know to expand in our own lives and consciousness. I bless the music knowing that all of it is here to support us, to, to, to sustain us, to nourish, because every moment of this service, every moment of life is an expression not just of the creator, but we, the created. So how good to know, and I am so grateful, so I simply say, and so it is, and together we say, amen. I believe we have a congregational song. Let's stand. So while we're standing, why don't we say together the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we'll do the congregational song. <laughs> See 
please be seated. <sighs> Meister Eckhart wrote that that which is closest to God, that which is most like God, is silence. And with that in mind, we are going to engage in just five minutes of silent meditation together. So I invite you to once again relax, put aside anything that you might be holding in your hands, let your feet rest on the floor, be where your body is. And I invite you too to just silently repeat to yourself, God's the love that I am. God's the love that I am. And I will bring you out of our meditation in just five minutes.
The words I have to say may well be simple, but they're true. Until you give your love, there's nothing more that we can do. Cause love is the opening door. Love is what we came here for. No. Have your eyes really seen? You say it's very hard to leave behind the life we knew. But there's no other way it's really up to you, it's really up to you, cause love is the key we must turn, truth is the flame we must burn, and free Have your eyes really Have your eyes really seen? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? Have your eyes really seen? Do you know what I Mm. All right, good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, this is our first day having two services in two years. This is great. I'm so excited. Yeah, we're on the way back. Oh, God, that feels, that, that's a relief. So, you know, Ernest Holmes says in our Science of Mind textbook that a realization of the presence of God is the most powerful healing agency known to humankind. And now Emma Curtis Hopkins, one of my favorites, says it another way. She says that God realized must produce an effect. And so our job, of course, as students who practice the science of mind, is always to have a spiritual realization about what the greater spiritual truth is. People do what we call bypass, you know what I mean? Because they don't want to confront something difficult. They don't want to confront the pain. So in metaphysics, what bypass looks like is, oh, it's all perfect. No, 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 it's all God. It's all good. It's all perfect. 
And when you're like, well, you know, that may be so spiritually, and I believe it is true spiritually, but on the earth plane, there are lots of things that need to be redeemed, lots of things that need to be lifted up, lots of things that need to be improved. Now, first of all, God is bigger than all of it. We have to get, as we start out today, God is always bigger than whatever the challenges, whatever the problems are that confront us. I, we, can turn to God and be lifted. How do I know? Because I've done it. This is what the science of mind teaches us. If we turn to God consistently, we will be lifted up above whatever condition seemingly confronts us right now. So you're not going to have your good if you're filled with accusation, right? If we have accusation about anyone else on the face of the planet, and I have not done well with this this week, I'm here to tell you, I have been filled with accusation, but I catch myself and do my spiritual work so that the accusation doesn't continue to live within me, right? Because you're not going to have the greater good that is destined for your life if you are filled with accusation. So how you react to the world how I'm reacting to the world is telling us how we are inside. So if I'm not perfectly at peace within myself, how am I going to experience peace in the world in which I live? You know, if I'm not loving in here, how am I going to be loving out here? If I'm not giving in here, how am I going to have the experience of giving out here? Right? So how you react to the world is telling you something about what's going on inside of you. And what I see is a reflection of what's inside of me. So I've been looking now for a number of weeks at all the places where I'm at war. All the places in me where I'm at war with someone or something or some organization or something. And you know, the truth is, it's not pretty. It's not pretty. Wow. You know, because, but everyone, everyone though, I know, deserves forgiveness, right? And what I know about forgiveness, after a lot of years on the spiritual path, is it takes time. It takes time. We have often taught, um, and I have been involved with what we call our foundation class, for more than 30 years. And, uh, and in it, there's an evening that we spend really looking at forgiveness. And every time, every time it comes up, what about self-forgiveness? That's probably harder than just forgiveness toward others, right? Forgiveness. I would say, all right, first of all, what does that mean to you? Um, and if we add self-forgiveness to that, what does that mean to you? What would it mean to you if you were able to forgive yourself? <sighs> so I don't know about you, but there are certainly a selection of things that I work with that I have held against myself. And you know, I wonder, like, why? Why? And I think, well, you know, I grew up in a very, very fertile garden of guilt. Yeah, it's true. Um, at home, uh, we experienced guilt because it was supposed to make us better, right? I understand. I understand the motivation behind the guilt, that making us feel bad was supposed to make us want to do better. It didn't work very well. Um, I remember guilt at school, similar thing. It was supposed to make us be better. It didn't work very well either. And certainly in my church life, there was an, a liberal, liberal sharing of guilt. All why? Because it was supposed to make us be better. I've discovered guilt does not make us better. Honest to God, it didn't. It never made me better. It made me feel bad, but it didn't make me better. And then, you know, if you feel bad and feel bad and feel bad long enough, you start to believe that that's who you are. Now, I know the science of mind is 180 degrees different from that. That is not who you are. So we want to separate today what you have done, what you have experienced, and who you are. Who you are is you are an emanation of the Most High God. You are a child of God. You are the beloved of God. You are part of God. And God does not hold anything against its expression. So God is not saying, wow, if I could just have a little more time, I could forgive Mark. But boy, he's just been such a jerk these past few years. It's going to be hard. So here's what I know. Forgiveness, self-forgiveness is a journey. It is a mistake to think it's a one-time incident. 
right? And I think the way it is often presented in the world that we live in is like it's a one-time thing. You know, something horrible happens to us. We say, well, did you forgive them? Say, oh, yes, I forgave them. It's all behind me now. That never happens, okay? I have not seen that happen. I have not heard of that happening. I think that is extraordinarily rare because forgiveness is a journey. It is a process. It's like unpacking something and unpacking more and unpacking more. I moved a few years ago. Okay, about four years ago. And I still have boxes in the garage that I haven't unpacked. And so I think, oh my, now they're books. I know what they are. I know what's in the boxes. They're books I haven't needed yet, but I will. <sighs> I will, I will. And I remind myself, though, that this, this too is a journey. Can I get to the place? And I find... This is, the hard, this, is the, this is that hard hurdle. Can I get to that place where thank you, God, for this experience? You say, well, why would I say thank you, God, for this horrible experience? It's something I clearly need to forgive. You know, it's like, well, because I was being grown. In that experience, I was being grown. You know, mistakes are part of the journey. I think if we're telling ourselves, oh, I'm never supposed to make a mistake. You know, I'm in the science of mind. I'm spiritual. I have these wonderful tools. I'm never going to make a mistake. That's, forget it. There, mistakes are made on the journey. Because it seems to me that most of what we learn comes from those difficult experiences. Do we learn through good things? Yeah, absolutely. And I, for one, would like to learn a lot more through joy than through pain. But here's what I've come to realize is the pain really gets our attention. Pain gets our attention to the point where we say, oh, this really stings. I need to do something about it. So self-forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Self-forgiveness. Why? Because we get free, right? And when we get free, life gets better. Now, yes, I know, self-forgiveness is hard. People don't permit it. I think they want to keep suffering in some kind of remorse. You know, we are so much more, though, than the mistakes. We are so much more than our past. Now, OK, so, so, so here's, the, here's the bottom line about this. Why self-forgiveness? Because, well, your mental and emotional well-being will certainly be improved. I believe that if you practice self-forgiveness, you will also, also have a more positive attitude, and you're going to have healthier relationships with other people. Don't do self-forgiveness, and you're going to feel unworthy. You're going to fear taking risks. You're going to even dip into despair. So the idea of self-forgiveness, we have to do this so that we can have peace, right? There's no partial letting go. You know, it's like they say, it's like in hand grenades, uh, hand grenades and parachutes. You know, you're either all in or all out. And so there's no partial letting go. People say, well, I'm, I'm kind of letting go. I'm kind of, no, you're not. You're still, if you're kind of letting go, you're still holding on. So let go. How do I let go? Let go. But how do I let go? Let go. How do I let go? Let go. It's one of those. You have to just keep making yourself let go. So letting go of feelings of anger, let go of feelings of resentment, feelings of retribution, toward who? Mm, toward someone you believe has wronged you. All right? And then, OK, so I, I, and if I've done that out here, then I have a much better chance of doing that here. Most of us, I think, are harder on ourselves than we are on other people. And we can focus so well on why we're guilty, why we have a right to be angry, why we're ashamed of how we've behaved. So we just tend to be harder on ourselves than others. We punish ourselves and wallow in that shame. Now, everybody, everybody on the face of the earth makes mistakes. But do we learn from them? Do we let go? Do we move on? So here are the keys to self-forgiveness. Learning from that experience, letting go, moving on. Really, what would be the worst thing that could possibly happen if you forgave yourself? Think about it. What could be the worst thing that would happen? I go out and do it again. Well, OK. Well, if you do, you do. But I bet you that time, that second time, you'll learn. If you keep beating yourself up and you keep believing in your badness more than your fundamental goodness, your fundamental okayness, that's going to be a problem. And the challenge of being stuck in the past, of keep remembering and reliving, and oh, I'm so terrible because I did this, I said this, I should have been better. The problem with that is if you keep beating yourself up, stuck in the past keeps you from moving forward. 
Now, of course, when we talk about forgiveness, even and especially self-forgiveness, this is not condoning bad behavior. Oh, I behave terribly. I forgive me. It's not that. You know, I accept what has happened. I'm willing to move forward and have empathy for those I have hurt along the way. So something that I have done and I think is helpful is to write a letter. So this comes from the work of Catherine Ponder, who I really love. Um, and Catherine Ponder does an exercise where you write a letter to another person's guardian angel. And I think, well, I could do that to, for myself, though. Could I not write a letter to my own higher self, my guardian angel, the god of my being? You know, because I'm doing the other things that we all know how to do, right? So we're praying, we're meditating, we're doing it. But something else that can help us release the hurt is to write a letter to, I'll call it the angel of our higher self, and say, I've been carrying this around. It's getting heavy. I think maybe now is time to let go of it. So here's what I did. Here are the amends I've made. Here's how I want to be going forward because I've learned from this. Right? Emma Curtis Hopkins says that every day we have to say, I forgive everyone and everything. I forgive everyone and everything. Now that includes me. When I forgive everyone, that includes me. See, I really thought everyone was like everyone else. <laughs> but it's really everyone including me. And to forgive yourself, you have to acknowledge your feelings. Right? So this is a place to start. Acknowledge my feelings. They might be guilt, they might be shame, they might be other things. I think everybody feels remorse when we cause someone else pain. But ignoring the emotions leads to more regret. Mm. So what do we do? We acknowledge what we did. We have all exhibited unskillful behavior. I don't know about you, but I certainly have. Lots and lots of it. But what I know now is I'm supposed to learn from those mistakes. So I ask myself, what was my role in that situation? This that I am having such a hard time forgiving myself for, what was my role in that situation? What did I say? What did I do? What did I withhold? Where did I not show up fully? Now, what are the lessons that are being offered to me? If I learn the lessons from this, I will avoid doing it again in the future. And if we keep replaying the incident, now I want you to know this is the inside scoop here because I have done this expertly. I have replayed the incident again and again and again. The problem with that is that we're focusing on what's wrong, not what we've learned. And by focusing on what's wrong, it kind of keeps us in that little hamster wheel. So here's the thing. If you caused harm, the path to self-forgiveness means you've got to apologize. Be big. You know, here you are, you're a big spiritual adult. Put on your big spiritual adult pants and forgive and apologize. Right? Admit you did wrong. Now, I know that's a hard pill to swallow. Admit I did wrong. Can I just apologize? Can I just say I'm sorry? No, you can't. Because if you admit you did wrong, this is often the piece that helps other people. And it's the piece that helps you so that you will not repeat it again. Acknowledge that, yeah, you know, that you have caused pain. And describe what you will do differently. Right? Because I think we tend, again, we tend to learn more from, from the mistakes. I can't just focus on what I did wrong, though. Because if I just focus on what I did wrong, I'm not going to learn a lot there. So what adjustments do I need to make going forward? And make those changes. Yes, my actions caused some problems. So I'm committed to changing my behavior. And this leads to a better possible future outcome. And then I think, OK, so there are some things, maybe things that happened long ago. And it's no longer appropriate to go to those people. Maybe they're not even alive. You know, maybe it's decades later. That I think a valuable thing to do is to say, you know, part of my amends into the universal mind is I'm going to do some good. And this I am particularly doing because 
I didn't do so good over here back when. See, I think it's important for us to not only to develop compassion for other people, but also for ourselves. And, and with that compassion, I would say, gee, there should also be some acceptance. There should be some kindness. If you keep beating yourself up, this is going to lead to a really bad self-perception. You know, that you are damaged and that you are not worthy of grace. And God's grace, we teach in the science of mind, God only knows to give of God's self to each and every one of us. So God never looks at us and says, God, he's so bad, I just can't forgive him. I'm going to have to work on this. Check in with me in six months. We'll see how that goes. No, forgiveness, self-forgiveness is a process. Yeah, it takes time. It's not a one-shot event ever. So we just have to take that off the table. As a rule, yeah, I have found it is easier to forgive other people. But we all have to take this on, I think, as a daily part of our spiritual practice, that before I go to sleep at night, is there anything I need to forgive anyone for? Is there anything I need to forgive myself for? Again, I think it's really important that we separate who we are from what we did. If you don't forgive yourself, you don't get off the hook. You still always have that I'm hung up kind of feeling. Yes, you are humanly flawed and have made poor decisions that cause suffering. And what we teach in Science of Mind is there is spiritual perfection within. And so that's the high bar that we hold up, the spiritual perfection within. I know I can do better. I know I can be more loving. I can be more forgiving toward other people and toward myself and toward the world that I live in. So I think we punish ourselves and we just wallow in shame. And that shame is just a little warmer than our own body temperature. <laughs> so it's very comfortable. We get familiar with it really fast. Ah, here I am in shame. I've said these bad things. I've done these bad things. I didn't show up as this person I wanted to be. Yeah, yeah. So we punish ourselves by wallowing in this shame. So today, I want to suggest to us that we treat ourselves with compassion, and understanding and mercy. Remember, God doesn't judge you. And if God doesn't judge us, then why are we judging ourselves so harshly? So my suggestion is we learn to treat ourselves with compassion and understanding and mercy in order to want to learn from the experiences, right? Because if something happened, there's a reason why it happened. We teach that in the science of mind. If something happened, there's a reason why it happened. If something is so, there's a reason why it's so. So I want to learn from the experiences. The second piece is that I have to accept responsibility for my actions, where I take responsibility, not as in a blame, but as in a, yeah, I was there, I was involved, this was up to me. In those areas where I take responsibility, I can heal, I can grow. My life can start to thrive in a way it has not thrived before because I'm willing to take responsibility for my actions. And also, I get to grow in ways that encourage effective change, that I know. You know like when you know you're going to be different from something? We've all been through experiences where on the other side we know, I am different because I went through that. And this will be our experience with self-forgiveness as well. So what I'd like you to do is join me in consciousness now. So close your eyes for a moment and bring your awareness to the pattern of your breathing, just for a moment with me. Breathe in, breathe out. Notice that you're breathing in. Notice that you're breathing out. And come to a peaceful, centered place within yourself a place where you are absolutely aware of your fundamental goodness, your fundamental okayness that's never touched, that's never hurt, harmed, or endangered in any way. And so from this place, breathing in and breathing out, I speak the word for us that we are willing to engage in a practice of self-forgiveness, no matter how long we felt guilty or bad about what we've said or done, no matter how long We've carried it with us. I speak the word that in this moment, in this holy instant right here, right now, God is greater than anything in our past. And so we turn to that presence, that power, that principle of God right here, right now, and I know we are lifted up. We see our part in all situations and circumstances. We see where we need to make amends. We see where we can be better. And we are committed to doing that from here on out. So bring to mind now what you have a hard time forgiving yourself for. 
Remembering that with God, all things are possible and that that spirit of the living God within you is so much bigger and greater than that lack of forgiveness you have for yourself. So I invite you to see that unforgiveness as, an, as a gift, that there was something valuable in it for you to learn about yourself, your life, your path of consciousness. And so having received that gift and being committed to doing better in the future, I know that all is well in God's universe. And so we recognize that there is a power greater than we are. It's spirit, it's love, it's infinite intelligence, it's the truth of our being. And we are one with this power. We are connected with each other on the unseen side of life. And I speak the word for us today that we are healed on every level of our being, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, wherever healing would be benefic beneficial to us, we accept that healing is already a fait accompli. It's already done in the mind of God. And we receive it. We say yes to it. We welcome it. And what does not serve us, whether it's a thought or belief, an idea, a habit pattern, if it does not serve us anymore, any old way of being, we let it be dissolved, released, let go, never to return again. The way is made clear for a more abundant expression of God life by means of us. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So all of those places that call for our attention, we say God is right there as love, as peace, as healing, as all needs met. We let this prayer wrap around our entire globe, touching all people everywhere. No one is excluded from the love of God. And so we bless our church, we bless all churches, synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I'm certain that we are blessed by being together in consciousness today, that there is raising up for each and every one of us. And so with a full heart, I say thank you, God, that this is the truth. I release this word into law, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen. All right, we'll sing one time together. I invite you to hold your gift over your heart and we'll say our statement of giving together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you very much. Too. Serious medicine. I'm not bringing my bucket to an empty well. Or reliving those heartbreak stories I keep wanting to tell. I don't need another excuse to feel afraid and weak. So I'll be using my to get up and speak to myself and I'm saying enough is enough is enough oh yeah enough is enough is enough cause I don't need to be right I don't have to be tough all I want to say is come on this is enough And I'm blessed And I'm a land Them critical voice 
voices in my head to rest, yeah. I'm thankful for the journey here to this moment in time. And I wouldn't go back and redo it for any reason or rhyme. Now I'm saying enough. Cause I don't need to be right, I don't have to be tough All I want to say is, ooh, this is enough, yeah Come on One foot in front of the other Smiling with my sisters and brothers, yeah Don't you know, the joy we reap is the love I don't know if you noticed, but Kuan Yin was singing backups for you. She was into it. All right. I know mine too. Okay. Thank you so much, Gia Chimbotti. Chimbotti. We can find your music on iTunes, correct? Yes, excellent. And Nelson Cole, thank you so much. Karen Smith, yay. So for all the ways that you can make donations to our church, please, please, please go to our website, nhcrs.org slash give. Uh, Prayer with a Practitioner is available right after the service. You can just come right up here. And if you are on Facebook, you need to zoom, zoom over to Zoom, please, and you'll be able to pray there. A oh, Wednesday over in the evening service. This week is Practitioner Liz Racy. Now, if you don't know Liz... You don't know Liz, and you need to know Liz, because she is awesome. So the meditation is at 6.50, the service is at 7, and her topic is change the discourse and find a new course. Yeah. Okay, women's group meeting today, in person and on Zoom. Uh, they're meeting at their new time, which is 1 o'clock. 1 o'clock today in the youth church, and as I said, on Zoom. And you can get links for all of the Zoom stuff at our website. Uh, men's group in person and on Zoom. Wow, we have got a lot going on. Um, now, it says 11, and so I'm going to take them at their word, 11 in the Ernest Holmes room and on Zoom. But remember, you're going to jump off because there's 1130 service here in the sanctuary. Because, by the way, first day back in two years, two services. This is really, this is monumental. We have not been back for two services since, I'm going to say, actually, it's almost two years, March 15th, right? Oh, goodness. Okay, well, we're glad you're here. There will be a memorial service for our emeritus practitioner, Dolores Cartolucci, on Friday, March 11th at 2 o'clock, right here in the sanctuary and on Zoom. All are welcome. We have a new class coming. It's called, okay, now, 
get this, somebody in marketing really had it together. It's called change your thinking, change your life. <laughs> Who thought? I mean, really. It's a five-week class, so you don't have to look at that 10-week, 12-week commitment. We're doing this in place of the spiritual practice class because we're just finding that we, we need some shorter chunks of classes, yeah? Okay, so it starts on Tuesday, March 22nd, in person and on Zoom. I want to recommend that you come in person because I know the teacher who's doing it, and man, she is so good in the room. Oh, it's me! Join me, Reverend Sydney, for Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. This is how, and it's a brand new class, by the way, new curriculum from CSL. You get to apply these principles and these practices to transform your life in the areas of relationship, prosperity, we like that, and health. Uh, sign up on the website. The cost is $170, and it counts, by the way, towards practitioner training if that's something that you have in the back of your beautiful, infinite mind. Uh, Zoom virtual patio is before and after our Sunday and Wednesday services, 9.45 service, by the way. Um, and Zoom meditation is every Monday through Saturday. It starts at 7.55 and goes to 8.15. And again, the links for all of this are on our website. Um, go to that, nhcrs.org, to get those links and for more information. And sign up for our weekly e-blasts and our monthly newsletters. We have so much going on. And by the way, since everything is opening up, we're going to have even more going on. So this is a great place to come and just feel loved and juicy and nourished and, and happy. So um, let me just see, what are we doing now? What I thank you. We're going to stand up and sing the peace song. And I'll take a breath. So please repeat after me, I'm at home in the heart of God. My life is anchored in truth. I can never be separate. I live in the consciousness of peace. I release all fear. I am living love. Thank you.